Welcome to the Fire Mountain Gems and Beads Jewelry Making Studio. I'm Lisa Pavelka, and today I've got a fun project for you. Some people like to wear their heart on their sleeve. I like to wear it around my neck. So I'm going to show you how to make this pendant that I call the Here my Heart, Here's My Heart Pendant. We're going to do a simpler version of it, uh, but you can always add a stone. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So it all begins with art clay silver, which is fine silver. This is pure silver, so it's a step above sterling. And we're going to open a 20 gram package, but you can actually do it with a 10 gram package. 20 grams is probably enough for me to make maybe four or five of these. So we're going to open this up, and it's wrapped several times to keep the air out of it because it's very sensitive to air. So we're going to take out the outer wrapping, the second wrapping, and then just find the seam and pull it apart gently, and that way you can get all the clay out of the package. Now you're going to want to have some food wrap standing by. I like to double the thickness. And you want to handle it in the food wrap as much as you can. We're going to save those scraps for later because every little bit is usable. So we're going to condition it. You don't know if there's any air bubbles in it when it comes out of the package, so we're just going to flatten it and fold it over. And this keeps it from sticking to my hands. All right, so we're just going to flatten a little bit more, and we want to roll it out to a uniform thickness. So um, I'm going to use these wonderful slats that can be used with metal clays, epoxy clays, and polymer clay. But And they come in different thicknesses, and the package will tell you what thickness you want. But we want a one millimeter thick uh, layer of clay, so those are your blue slats. And I've already pre-treated all my tools and my materials using the Silk Baby release agent. This is um, easily applied with your fingers or a cosmetic sponge, and you want it on every surface this is going to come in contact with. So I'm using this nonstick Teflon sheeting, and you can cut it in all different sizes and shapes for the projects you're going to use. And we'll put the slats on either side. That's going to give us a uniform thickness. And with my conditioned roller, I'm just going to roll it out until I can't roll it anymore. That's going to give me that uniform thickness. You can see that's quite a bit of clay there. Now this is real fresh, so if it doesn't come off cleanly, you may have to let, let it sit and dry a little bit. The fresher your clay, the more chance you need to let it evaporate for just a little bit. So we want to fold it gently and compress any air bubbles out. And we're going to let it set for just a little bit, like that. And while we're letting it dry out, and it dries out in seconds, I just want to quickly mention that if you add a stone, uh, you can see how that's done in my border ring tutorial and see how I do the bezel. Larger fireable stones have to be done in a kiln, and you can torch fire any stone under five millimeters. Now in just that little bit of time I've been chatting, we're going to go back to our clay and see if we can't roll it out smoothly. And you can use any type of shape you want. I like this clay cutter set because it comes in all different shapes and sizes. And if you don't get a real smooth area to work on, you can always just dip your finger and smooth it out like that. Okay. So I've already taken, this is my love letter stamp. And this is from the Romance Collection. And I have several of my stamps here at Fire Mountain Gems and Beads that are available. And they're all wonderful to work on different types of materials, including polymer clay, metal clay, epoxy clay. You can even use them on paper and fabric. So I've pre-treated this with a little bit of my cool slip. And I'm going to remove the slats. And while it's on this backing, we're just going to flip it right over onto the stamp. Now, sometimes I have to repeat this step because if you press too deeply, you can actually cut through the clay. And I want the letters to be just barely embossed. So I'm going to roll it pretty lightly. You'd be surprised. It doesn't take much to get a nice embossed effect. Let's see if I can get this the first time. And it should release pretty cleanly from the stamp. If it doesn't, it's still too fresh. But I actually kind of like the letters there. I'm going to show you a quick trick. Instead of having to do it again to smooth it out, I can just go ahead and dampen my fingers and just lightly stroke some water over the top and smooth it right back down without having to re-stamp it, just like that. 
So I'm going to take the second largest of the heart cutters, and you can choose any cutter you like, but I really love a heart motif. And you can do it with the letters so that they're nice and horizontal from side to side, or you can cut it so they're askew at an angle. And I, I also treated my cutter, put some of that cool slip around there. And I'm going to pull away the clay from the cutter, and we're going to just preserve that folding it and compressing any air out so we don't get air bubbles and putting it in our plastic wrap, storing it in a plastic baggie with a damp piece of paper toweling and I should be able to come back to that for several days and sometimes even a couple weeks and still have usable clay if I'm not ready to use it all the same day. Now we're going to remove the cutter and you should get a pretty nice clean cut but we're going to have to do a little refining in a bit. I'm not adding a stone to this one, but I am going to show you how I'm going to make the opening to make it hang. Now you might like the opening in the center. I like it so that my heart hangs at an angle. Now to make it a bit more decorative and to make it a little stronger at the hang point, I like to make it look like I've got a rivet opening in there. So that is very simply done with a little of your extra clay. It doesn't take much. We can take a little ball about the size of maybe a BB or a little bit bigger. That's, I think that's too big, so more like a BB. Okay, so you can see how big that is. We're just going to lay that right next to it while I wrap up the clay. And with a damp brush, you might want to wick a little water away so it's not too damp. You want to wet that area right there. And if you want to make it extra secure, you can use a little paste, or I'm using the slip syringe, which is a bit stickier, it almost acts like a glue. And I'm just going to put the eensiest little blob right there. And we're going to flatten that down right over the top of it, just like that. Okay, And then you can use a small straw, stir straw, like a coffee straw, or you can take a needle tool, and you want to make a pilot hole. Now this hole doesn't have to be clean, doesn't have to be pretty, but it does have to be big enough that when you fire it, it's not going to shrink back closed on itself because we can drill this out bigger. And that paste is going to make those two pieces fuse together. So there's that pilot hole. And we're going to dehydrate it. So depending on where you live, it may take a couple of hours, but I usually would leave it overnight if I'm going to let it air dry. You can also use a food dehydrator, or I like to throw it in an oven. The same oven I'm baking my polymer clay in, just as long as it's not over 250 degrees, because you don't want to prematurely get the binder out. And when it's dry, we can do a little bit of cleanup, a little refining. So when it's completely dry, we're going to need a rubber block to work on. That's going to give us a nice stable surface to work on. And you can use sandpaper. I'm really crazy about these new diamond files that Fire Mountain Gems and Beads offers because they have this nice grip, ergonomic grip and um, whatever file you need depends on what shape or angle you're trying to um, work on. Now here I didn't do that reinforced hole. You can do a simple hole. It should be strong enough, but I just wanted to show you variation. Now, as opposed to working with a crosscut file, I like the diamond files because you can file it from back and forth and it speeds up the filing. And you see how I'm barely holding this. It's like, it's like filing a potato chip. And it would break very easy in this state, which is known as the greenware state. So you can file it and just get those edges nice and clean if you want a little bit more rounding at the bottom. And in here, where there's the angle of the inside of the heart, I can take the round file and refine it further. Now let's just say that you didn't refine it to your liking before you fired it and you find you've got some rough edges. You can always go back after you fired it and file it some more. Or you can use the jewel tool to uh, touch up your pieces and refine them further. So it doesn't take much. You can see all that dust there just coming off very quickly. Now here's where I have to be a little bit more delicate. I want to make the hole a little bit bigger. You can go back after firing and drill it bigger with a hand drill or a power tool, but you just want to make sure that that hole is big enough, as I said, that it's not going to close on you when you fire. So with the round diamond file, very gently, very slowly, and giving some support with my finger and holding it on the edge here. Let's see if you can see it better at that angle. Just gently, gently, slowly drilling, and that's going to enlarge that hole. I can, again, I can go back after and make it bigger. 
So we want to go ahead and take a dry brush and make sure you brush off all the dust. Any dust you leave on there is going to fire right into it. And if you want the front to be a little shinier, you can make it easier to get a high mirror finish on it. If you just take some sandpaper, and you can get the set that comes in various grits, I'm going to skip right away to the 2000 because it's pretty smooth to start with. I don't need to go through all the grits. I also don't want to sand it too much because I don't want to lose my letters. But the more you refine it before you fire it, the less work you have to do afterwards. And it's easier in the green work stage. Easier is better, don't you think? Okay, so there's a lot of dust in here. We want to get that out and save that dust. Put that into your jar of paste. Okay, make sure it's all off the front, the back, and now we're ready to torch fire. You can kiln fire it, but uh, torch firing I think is just the most fun. So we're going to take the fire brick, and this is an amazing fire brick. We'll move our tools out of the way and anything flammable. You can't be safe enough, but it's very easy to torch fire. So we're going to take our butane torch, and we're, this ignites by pulling down the safety, and then we're going to hold in uh, the button that holds it on so we don't have to hold the button continuously with our finger and we're going to push the ignition. There we go. All right, we're looking for a nice sharp hiss and the flame to be a nice point. And we're going to torch fire this for two to three minutes in a room that's well ventilated and with the lights a little dim. So if you're working in a bright area like I am, we're going to look for a light pink glow. Now, the first thing you're going to see is a little bit of smoke, and that goes away quickly. Just hold your breath and make sure, again, you're in a well-ventilated room, and you're going to see a little fire, and that burns away very quickly. That's that organic cellulose binder burning away, and this is when the shrinkage occurs, about 8 to 10%. So what you're going to look for in a room that's not completely dark but slightly dim is a pink glow, and that's when you time it. So I'm going to try to shade this here and see if you can see just a little pale pink glow there. Now, if this was a darker room, that would be more of a deep salmon color. Now watch what it's doing. This is really fun. See how it's curling up? Usually it will just flatten itself right back out. Nine times out of ten, it'll go completely flat. Once you see that pink glow, you're going to start timing it for two to three minutes. So we'll just use a kitchen timer or an app on your phone, but you don't begin to time it until you get the glow. We're just moving our torch around to keep our, um, our color consistent. And we're going to reset that timer. We haven't been going quite a minute, so I'm just going to go a minute and a half. And again, you're looking for that pink glow. You see that glow? Go for the glow. And if it starts to look red or shiny, you want to back that torch away. You're getting in too close. And just move the torch so you keep that color consistent. Bigger pieces, you're going to have to move the torch a little bit faster. You can judge. It's, it's very easy. If you've never torched before, it's a skill set that you develop very, very quickly, usually in your first torch firing. And you notice I'm standing back from the piece. I'm not standing right over it. You don't want any hair hanging down or loose clothing. So we're just going to go a little bit over a minute. And at this point, it's metal. If we don't fire it long enough, it's not going to properly center and it could be brittle. But two minutes should do the trick on a piece like this. And you can see how that lettering is really popping out. So you can use my other texture stamps. Those are, those are fun to use. Uh, but I, I just love the sentiment of the love letter. Okay, that should be about two minutes. So hold your torch straight up, press the ignition button, and set it safely out of the way. Now, this is still molten metal, so I'd burn myself if I touched it. But because I don't have a stone in there, I can I can quelch it right away, and we're going to find a pair of tweezers, or we can use some jewelry pliers to pick it up. So I'm just going to scoot it over to the edge. Notice I'm working on a ceramic tile. 
this brick is cool to the touch underneath. It's very hot on top, but cool to the touch underneath. I'm just gonna put it to where I can safely grasp it. Now listen for this. You're gonna hear this hiss. We're gonna move this out of the way. It's already cool, okay? And it's metal. It's amazing, it's like instant alchemy. So let's just dry this off and we can go right to the refining state. So we wanna move this out of the way. This is gonna stay quite hot for a little bit, so you wanna make sure you're not gonna have it anywhere where you're gonna come in contact with it. And we're gonna go right back to our rubber block, which is a great surface to refine on, and we're taking a metal brush. Watch your fingers and just brush aggressively. See how it's turning silver? It already was silver, if you're new to the clay. It's just that we're laying down those molecules, we're flattening them. Don't forget the back. And your edges. So we can leave it this matte finish right there, or we can take it to a, a shine, and there's a number of ways we can do that. My favorite is to do it by hand, so that I have uh, my hands in every step that I do. I can also use a, a rock tumbler with mixed steel shot, and I can use my jewel tool, which I, I do quite often, especially if I'm doing multiple pieces. But the harder we press with this, with the agate burnisher, and I'm using not the tip, but the flat edge, the shinier it's getting. Look at how it brings up that beautiful shine. So you might want to just leave it all silver, like this piece here. Or you might want to patina it, and that is putting in an agent that's going to color the recessed area, in this case the letters, and one of my favorite products to use is this liver of sulfur gel. If you've ever worked with liver of sulfur before, you know how stinky it can be. Uh, you can dilute this with hot water, and there's all kinds of cool things you can do when you get into liver of sulfur, making uh, patinas that do different colors, but that's for another time. But just, if you want to darken the letters and have black in the recessed areas, we're going to go ahead and finish burnishing this up. And I'm just going to lay down a napkin or a piece of paper toweling. And you can use a brush, but I like to use a cotton swab because I can dispose of it. You always want to make sure that you work in a well-ventilated vent area, although this isn't as smelly as just traditional liver of sulfur. And I pick up some gel on a brush or a cotton swab and we're gonna lay it right over the top and it, you can watch it do its magic. It's gonna take a little bit longer if we don't have any hot water mixed with it. But what it's gonna do is blacken our piece. The longer I leave it sit, the darker it's gonna get. Now sometimes you can arrest this stage by just rinsing it off. You'll get different colors. Uh, you can see pinks and purples and blues and greens. Uh, it can be a little hard to control it if you're looking for a, a special color effect, but you can just rinse it off with a little baking soda and that will stop that process in some cool water. So it's already starting to darken. Okay, So you can get it to where it's kind of a golden brown color and be a little bit more subtle, or you can just wait until it goes all the way black. But we're going to stop it just a little short so we can see the magic here. I'm going to first wipe it off with my napkin here. So this has more of like a sepia tone patina, which is fun. And then I'm going to take a baby wipe and dispose of this and just clean this off a little bit more to stop that process. Or you can just rinse it if you like. So sometimes when I patina my work, I just leave it the way it is, especially if you want a very vintage or antique look. Let's take a look at that. It's, it took on kind of a golden coppery hue, which is really pretty. But if you take, and I'm really a big fan of uh, these uh, moonshine polishing cloths. This is a pre-treated cloth that will polish all kinds of precious metals from silver to gold, uh, copper, bronze. And they last a long time. Look at that. Look how it just takes off all that uh, patina, but it leaves it in the recessed area. And it's just leaves it beautifully patinaed. And you just use this cloth. You move on to a clean spot when it starts to get real black, like it's doing. 
like that. And you just use the whole cloth until it just is all black and you can't use it anymore and you use both sides. So it's very economical. And I always travel with these. I cut little pieces and put them in my travel jewelry case because I can always touch up all my, all my precious metal jewelry if it needs a little sparkle. So there you have it. Just want to show you if you want to enlarge your hole, how easy it is to do afterwards. You can do it by hand or with a power tool. You can continue to enlarge it now because it's metal and it's strong. I can use a little bit more elbow grease on it. But all I need to do now is add a jump ring and I'm sure all of you or most of you know the right way to open and close a jump ring from side to side and a decorative chain and it's ready to go. And here's my heart. Well, I hope you had fun watching along and that you're going to have fun making hearts too. Thanks for joining me here in the Fire Mountain Gems and Beads Jewelry Making Studio, and happy clay. Mm -hmm.